Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our expert panel for uh, careers in marketing for international students. Tonight, we are joined by recent graduates and international students from institutions all across Canada and internationally from outside of Canada. My name is Han, and I will be moderating our session this evening. First, I have a few housekeeping items to go over with you. These are just administrative logistical uh, topics that just to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible. So all participants have been muted. Uh, there's no need to use your video and you should be able to hear via your computer device. Uh, if you have questions, please make sure to use the Q&A section at the very bottom to ask your questions because these are going to be directed to the speakers. The chat function is just a chat to introduce yourself or perhaps make comments or share resources. So use the chat function for that. But if you have questions for the speaker, please make sure to use the Q&A section, okay? And of course, this session is being recorded. Um, also, everyone will receive a copy of the Devant newsletter, your Devant Inside. And make sure to visit uh, our website, uh, www.devant.ca slash all events. And that's where you can see future events that uh, may be of interest to yourself, your colleagues, or anyone that you might know. Um, again, uh, let's get started. My name is Han. Um, before joining Devant, I work in the nonprofit sector in settlement and employment services for newcomers to Canada. So the area of immigration and program development and workforce development and helping newcomers succeed is where my heart is. And so I'm happy to help out at any time. Uh, for this expert panel, we're being hosted by Devant. And I wanna give you some information about Devant before we get started. Devant is a subsidiary of Academica Group. Academica Group has been around for 20 years or so. They are the largest company providing research and consulting expertise to colleges and universities across Canada. They focus on student recruitment, student success, and career development. And Academica Group started Devant because they saw the challenges and opportunities that international students and recent grads have when they are looking to establish a career in Canada. Devant is French and it quite literally means in front of so we believe that our services and, and, and support will bring you in front of the rest of your journey to stay, work, and succeed in Canada. Uh, so with Devant, they have over 60 years expertise in higher education and uh, career development. So we are here to set up, we are here to be set up to provide assistance to international students like yourselves. So we have two great uh, guest speakers today on our panel. Gabrielle Jane, she's uh, from Canadian Marketing Association, as well as Jeff Sage from SageCom. Jeff, uh, he's a senior strategist. Uh, he's a co-founder and CEO at SageCom with 20 years of progressive experience in marketing communications in both public and private environments, including education, technology, banking, government, and so on. Gav, uh, Jeff has also been a member of Fanshawe's part-time faculty. He's teaching communications and technology courses in Fanshawe's Department of Continuing Education, including the communications for managers in the Ontario Management Development Program. And in its full-time corporate communications and public relations postgraduate program, Jeff holds a BA in political science from Western University, a postgraduate certificate in corporate communication and public relations from Fanshawe College, and a master of social digital media from Burnham City University. He's also completed the Ivy School of Business Executive Leadership Program. Jeff, in 2013, Jeff was honored as one of London's top 20 under 40. He's a founding board member of the London Cares Homeless Response Service and currently sits as treasurer. He's also a past member of the board of directors for United Way of London, Middlesex for 10 years, the Museum London Foundation and the Emergent Leaders London Community Network of which he was also a founder. Our second panelist, Gabrielle Janes. Uh, she is an experienced and passion, uh, passionate management executive with over 20 years association experience. 
She excels in leading online adult learning and developing opportunities for young professionals to grow their knowledge, skills, and confidence. In her current role of senior advisor to the CMA learning team, she utilizes her knowledge and insights to help both senior marketing leaders and those aspiring to hold both marketing leadership roles achieve their goals. She understands what marketers need to know today and bring enthusiasm and critical thinking to the planning of each marketing learning program. So welcome uh, both uh, Gabrielle and uh, Jeff to our panel today. It's great to have you. Our pleasure. Great to be here. Yes. Um, so I thought that we have a few questions that we could ask you, Jeff, I, I thought I could uh, ask you first. Um, uh, with your expensive, extensive uh, experience, Jeff, what advice do you have on getting certifications or designations in the marketing field in Canada and in Ontario? And which ones do you think are key to getting employed? Yeah, great question. So I'm going to, uh, I was actually asked this, this question by a client. I'm going to share a couple slides with y'all to go through this one, to answer this one, because um, I, I thought they'd be relevant. So, you know, what, what kind of skills matter right now in the field? Um, I want to talk a little bit about change and crisis and communication kind of in the age of acceleration. And in the last dozen months or so, we've been through a global pandemic, the stock market crashed, the wealth gap grew, we've been through environmental disasters, warmest record on year, inequality reached unprecedented levels, uh, technology adoption left 10 years in the last 12 months, and the nature of work kind of got turned on its head. There was an insurrection in the US and truth became an elusive commodity. And here we are at the Devant expert panel. It's for all of these reasons that I think communication has become probably the most important skill in the world right now. The world's changing really quickly all around us. We've been through the largest increase in expressive capability in human history. Uh, in the year 2000, there was 360 million people on the internet. This morning, there was about 5.3 billion. And, uh, you know, a few months back, kind of AI woke up. Uh, you know, newspapers in 1950, there was 102 newspapers per 100 households, and now there are none. And so the days of traditional media kind of delivering a common understanding of complex issues has ended, and organizations will need to deliver most of these messages themselves. And so the bottom line is we're communicating a lot more with all of this technology, but we're not communicating well. At the same time, everything is speeding up uh, and getting faster. We're working faster, we're trading faster, we're dating faster, we're cooking faster, we're cleaning faster, we're communicating faster. Unfortunately, we're consuming everything faster. And change is really the only permanence and uncertainty is the only certainty. And this is starting to cause a, a widening gap between our biology and the way that we live. And anthropologists coin this as uh, stone agers in the fast lane. And it basically means our brains aren't built for speed or for multitasking. Um, and, and you see after the kind of industrial revolution there, you know, we're, we're starting to get into this technological revolutions, but we're not really built for it. And when we communicate too quickly, it often leads to failure. And you see brands doing this all the time, uh, all over the world. And this fast paced kind of environment leaves us, um, you know, leaning on our learned behaviors and our biases that often create the very issues and crises that we're trying to avoid. And at the same time, misinformation is penetrating further and faster and deeper than accurate information. Identifying truth is now, you know, has life or death consequences in, in a lot of different areas that you might work in. That's not a dig at healthcare professionals or politicians or the scientific community or anyone in particular. I think it means that staying connected and creating value uh, as a student means that you need to be part of redesigning the ecosystems in which we're all communicating because meaningful communication is not about trying to avoid miscommunication. Communication that connects is about being present enough to know when you're not connecting and that's what I think the next generation can really bring uh, to the table in a meaningful way. And the sooner you know you're not connecting, the sooner you can fix it. 
And if you can get good at that, I think you're going to be valuable no matter where you work. And it's for those reasons, I think communication has become the most important skill in the world right now. And so if you're going to go out and get a designation or take training or take a course, uh, I think you should, I think you should lean into communication because you'll be valuable if you're good at telling stories anywhere that you land. That's an interesting take about um, communication is you feel is the number one skill that's, that, um, that is really required nowadays. Um, how, how do you refine that? How do you develop that? Does it take years to take, uh, uh, in your opinion, uh, to kind of develop? No, I think you can, you can learn it. They're natural storytellers, but we're, we're built to tell stories, right? Like our, that's why I leaned into the biology a little bit. Like we're built to tell stories. It was how our civilization literally constructed itself. Uh, we started to tell each other stories and that's really how we are able to um, aggregate ourselves and work together at scale. Uh, we started telling each other stories about uh, government and faith and all of these things so that we could sort of get one story that, that got us all together so that we could work uh, on one sort of thing. And, and we need those movements today. We have massive problems that we need to solve, uh, climate change, healthcare, regardless of where you you end up, if you're able to communicate well, if you're able to tell stories, um, you know, you're going to be valuable no matter where you go. And, and storytelling, you can look it up. Uh, I have a whole other section on, on storytelling. We can maybe go through a different session, but, you know, you can learn how to do this well. It's in your DNA, literally. And there's so many, you know, TED Talks and Harvard Business Review articles you could fill, you know, a, a dozen libraries on how to do this well. For some reason, uh, in boardrooms around the world, we're leaving that behind. Uh, and, and you know, it's not a, a fad uh, storytelling. This is in communication. This is what binds us together as a species and and you know for some reason uh leadership around the world kind of leaves it on the table and and we don't do well at communicating which is why we have uh why we have the agency that we do mm -hmm. uh, so i'm grateful for that but yeah you can learn how to communicate well and most of you probably do it naturally you think about sitting with your friends and your family and the first thing you usually do is is light up a good story about what's going on in your life um, it's no different. You just need to learn how to see them and translate those to your, your work life. Excellent. Gabrielle, what are your thoughts and your experience with that as well? The communication can, skills, storytelling. I can absolutely affirm that the need for um, enhancement in storytelling, uh, people have in fact seemingly lost the touch. And how I can affirm that is in my role at the Canadian Marketing Association, and I also have a significant role that I play at Scala Network. At Scala Network, we develop leadership programs. And in those leadership programs, the number one topic that the people that go through the program tell us they was their aha moment or how they learned so much is in fact the storytelling um, um, sessions that we have. In the business world, we are always getting a call from organizations to help train um, on that topic. And part of it is because there's an understanding that um, no matter how important their information is, they're not getting the story across. It's not landing somewhere. Um, every, everyone I think knows the importance of data now in marketing, but the data doesn't mean anything if you can't communicate what it's telling you. So data visualization and storytelling are, is a huge topic, a very, very important topic there. And it, it just, really affirms what Jeff has been saying. And, and uh, Gabrielle, can you talk about more about CMA, what, what CMA is? I know you're talking about how they have a leadership program, but can we uh, go back and uh, what is CMA and um, you know, what's uh, Charter Marketers designation program? How can the associ association help uh, the audience, which are international students today? Sure, the Canadian Marketing Association is an industry association not-for-profit. It was started in 1967. 
it's gone through some variations, but really what we are here to do is um, represent the interests of marketers everywhere uh, in Canada um, and to um, affirm that marketing is a, is a very significant uh, business driver of results. Um, so in supporting the industry, we support the marketers who are in it by through a lot of training programs. And in the last couple of years, we actually became acutely aware that there is a greater need to help students who are in colleges and universities have a much better sense of what does a career in marketing actually mean. So with the help of a couple of lead sponsors such as RBC and Google, we actually developed a platform strictly for students or primarily for students. So I will put this in the chat, but um, the platform is free to access. Uh, it is called the CMA Next program, NXT. And basically what it is, is a, a repository of all kinds of information that would help you say in the job search. So resume prep, um, nailing interviews, making the most out of LinkedIn. Uh, there's a huge number of topics, but there are also significant number of videos that are with uh, people that hold different roles in marketing that explain um, what their role does, how it integrates with the rest of marketing. So. I think the, the thing that CMA has right now, which is the most powerful and direct link to um, students of, of all levels is that platform, CMA Next. And as I said, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. And then in addition to that, what we primarily do to support the marketing industry on the, on the training side is we have a series of courses, anything from short courses like webinars through longer courses that uh, lead to a certificate, and then four years ago, we launched a program called the Chartered Marketer uh, Designation. And again, what, how we see this is a natural path for those that have decided to pursue a career in marketing. There are professional designations for just about every industry in Canada. Marketing is not a regulated industry. Um, so you don't need to have a designation to practice marketing. And what we have now are a number of individuals that have gone down a certain path. So they're a specialist, uh, like a digital native, for example. And this program will help those people um, really fill in all of the key comp uh, competencies in marketing, understand the strategic thinking more than the execution or as a new level, uh, become better business leaders. So there's financial management, particularly as it pertains to marketing. And there's a leadership component of that. So that's what the designation does. And it is something that students would enter after they complete their undergraduate degree or diploma. That's a really good uh, resource, the CMA Next program, as well as uh, a potential path for students to do when they graduate their undergrad program. Um, wonderful resource for newcomers to Canada, um, as well as sort of um, not only resources, but I feel like a lot of international students really need a, a larger network to really land and understand marketing industry as well as connections. Jeff, what, what can you say about marketing students um, to the students uh, in the audience today? What can they do to network while they're in school? Um, because again, they're new to country, the country, how do they do that? Are there any specific networking sessions that um, they should be attending? And before you answer that, Jeff, um, anyone, please, if you have any questions, make sure to go in and feel free to pop those questions in the Q&A because we are uh, looking for those questions to answer for you. So Jeff, what can they do to network? Yeah, so that's a really great question. So, you know, em employers love to hire people who can demonstrate that they're motivated and that they're hardworking, even if they haven't been getting paid for their efforts. And so volunteering is probably one of the one of the most underrated ways to get an insider's advantage. Um, volunteering helps lift job seekers spirits, they make them feel needed and productive. And, you know, that's an important Thing for people dealing with a prolonged job search. And so, you know, kind of projecting that positive mindset while, you know, uh, projecting confidence is probably one of the most critical elements of success for finding work. And, you know, volunteering lets you expand your network of contacts really easily. 
and hyper effectively and, and kind of demonstrate the skills and willingness to kind of jump in and help out. Um, arguably, finding a job today really is all about networking. And when you volunteer, you gain access to people you might not otherwise meet, creating opportunities, to develop positive relationships outside of a traditional work environment. So, you know, any kind of person that's working in higher education that I've ever met, uh, when I've asked them for advice or to take an informational interview, um, has been more than happy to kind of hang out and really answer any questions that I have for as long as I want. Uh, and so I made some really great uh, connections when I was in school, just by kind of hanging out with some of my professors, uh, getting to know some of the people who run the school, the administrators, and just asking them for informational interviews. So for example, regardless of what school you're at right now, if you wanted to get a marketing communications, there's a marketing communications department and just kind of showing up to the front desk and asking if you can meet with one of the directors for an informational interview is a great start. Uh, and it's a really easy and cost-effective way to kind of grow your network. But um, at that same place, there's also like, you know, professional associations like uh, International Association for Business Communicators. And, and, you know, there's just a bunch of them. But, you know, I would, I would look for people that you share common value with that are in the field. Uh, reach out to people at your school that do the work, reach out for people in your community that are doing marketing and communications, check out their flow, their vibe online. If you feel like there's a connection there, I would reach out and, and ask for an informational interview. I probably do two or three of those every month, uh, if not more, um, with students. And it's kind of how I got uh, uh, a bit of a leg up when I was going to school um, just reaching out and getting to, to know people. So it doesn't have to be this formal process where you're going to a networking event and you're, you know, if, if you have a cool prof who's teaching and marketing, ask them to hang out for a little bit and ask them some questions. I, I think information interviews are fantastic. Um, but in your experience, what kind of questions, uh, I guess, from the other side of uh, um, students asking you for an information interview, um, or yourself asking for inter information interview when you were younger. What are those questions if, you know, if, what would those look like? Uh, what kind of questions that they would ask during an information interview? Yeah, well, so you, you, want, you want to achieve two things, right? If you want to get a uh, placement or you want to work somewhere, you want the person uh, that you're talking to to like you, number one. And number two, you want to show them that you can add value to the organization that they're at. And you do those two things by talking about them and their organization, not by talking about you and your skills. And that's kind of Dale Carnegie 101. Uh, and so if you start asking someone who's passionate or who is an expert in a field about their work and their history and their organization and their lives, uh, you're going to make a connection and stand out uh, uh, around all the other applicants because there are a lot of people who sort of show up and start talking about themselves and what's going on. And there's a time and a place for that if you're asked. Um, but to make a connection, you really want to do research before you show up and really be interested in them uh, and mm -hmm. their work and uh that's a magic, a magic bullet. Um, but you know, very few people sort of uh, take advantage of that. That's great advice. Um, be interested in them and their work. Gabrielle, in your experience, um, uh, any any thoughts on information interviews, and you know, what are the keys to successful information interviews? We we all are. Uh, Jeff is absolutely right. I haven't met anyone in the industry that isn't willing to do an information interview. It may not be exactly in you know, the next day or so, but, but everyone is willing to. Um, I really like what Jeff said. If someone comes to the, the meeting and they come prepared, they know something about uh, you or the company. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest uh, is that it's, a, it's very helpful for the students to get to know what's going on in the industry. 
Um, so for example, if you were meeting with somebody at a school, you might be asking, you know, what, how is the school reacting to, you know, the onslaught from chat GPT? Um, how do people see people in the industry? How do they see that their, their, their role, their firm might be affected by it? What are the uses that they can see? What are the opportunities? I'm just using one example because AI is so prevalent in, in marketing right now. But, um, you know, another another question to ask, because this is very valuable information to get is, um, you know, where, how, how do you manage to create a fantastic campaigns with limited budget funds? Because clients don't have that, that much. And yet um, agencies are doing a fantastic job of working with very small budgets. So once th this kind of information is, um, it's not only making a connection, but it's also adding to your, your marketing skills or your life skills, because a lot of this stuff is, sounds almost like it's too easy, but it is a bit of common sense. Definitely. I think those sessions are, are great learning experiences for the, the, the mentees, I guess, for sure. Um, I, we have two questions uh, that I, I wanted to pose uh, just to make sure that we have enough time for them as well. Uh, first question is from Yash. Should I consider marketing, especially digital marketing, as my career at this time, where there is AI tools, as you're saying, Gabrielle, like ChatGPT, is, is marketing a safe career choice? What do you think? Or do you think it's going to be obsolete because of ChatGPT? What are your thoughts? Well, I think that Jeff actually started us off on the right foot. The one thing that's not going away is communication. <laughs> so um, I, I, do, I don't believe that ChatGPT is going to um, uh, eliminate all of the roles in marketing. I do believe it's going to change how we do marketing. Um, so whether somebody becomes a digital specialist, um, there are tons of opportunities in that field right now. But is that what is that what it's going to look like in five or 10 years from now? So my advice probably would be to become very well versed in something extremely foundational, such as marketing communications. In the 20 years that I've been doing professional development programs for marketers in Canada, that has always been at the root, at the foundation of everything. Then you can start to develop your specialties. And you, you can't go wrong with this uh, because it's, it's, been, it's never lost its shine or its need. Um, so I, I definitely support Jeff on that. And I think to be open, if, if I were entering right now into a marketing career, I would, I would find myself very open and not too defined by what a specific job title is, because I think those are probably going to change over time. But the skill set that's needed, there will always be foundational needs. All right. Jeff, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, ChatGPT. So, um, you know, the first point I'd make is be mindful of the gold rush of, right. of technology when it comes out, right? It, it's happened over and over and over. And if you look at the history of uh, how we adapt and adopt technology, we're not really very good at it out of the gate. We usually use it for really dumb stuff. And then over a period of time, things kind of get better uh, and regulation shows up and we, and we do a better job and you can look up, you know, how we use the printing press when it came out up, up until social media, whatever. Chat GPT is interesting because this is a revolutionary piece of technology and it's going to change the same as, you know, Bitcoin and be careful of the early stages. Half of what you're reading is BS and half of what you're reading, you should really take seriously. In terms of, you know, are the robots going to replace us? I look at technology like chat GPT like this. Um, you know, th this is a tool that you're going to be able to use uh, to make your work and your thinking and all this kind of stuff better. I think it is in terms of like, is it going to replace us? I think it is going to replace mediocre work. And so if you're a mediocre person doing mediocre work and phoning it in and you can kind of see communication all around. Sometimes you'll go to an event, there's a thousand people in a room and I'll pick on a bank, uh, you know, a, a, a bank is sponsoring and someone gets up and reads this terrible 
piece of copy that you're like, you have a thousand people here and you're really going blah, 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 corporate speak and everyone's falling asleep. So I think people who make content like that, you know, uh, there's not going to be any space for that. But if you're passionate about marketing, if you're passionate about digital media, then I think you should go into it. Whatever you're good at, lean in that way. It's kind of like sometimes you're like, follow your passion. If I followed my passion, I'd be in a canoe out in the wilderness <laughs> right now and I wouldn't have any money. Uh, and so that wouldn't be great. Um, so figure out what you're good at. You know, look at the tools and the gold rush of technology with some skepticism. Uh, get to know the technology. Find out how it's going to be regulated and weave that into what you're doing. Uh, you know, is is the industry going to evaporate? Absolutely not. And I think if you're if you're leaning into the cornerstone of any kind of technology with that communication route, you're going to be valuable no matter where you land because. Uh, the world is a bit topsy-turvy right now and things are less clear than they used to be and clear communication is going to be worth a lot. And so absolutely a tool like ChatGPT would be a great tool for you to learn and understand and weave into the nature of your work ongoing. But I don't think you have to be worried about, you know, the industry evaporating. It's just going to change. So it's not going to look like it did 10 years ago. Um and this will have a bigger impact than other technologies did. When I was coming through, you look at Microsoft and Apple and, you know, the, the iPhone, you know, uh, these took 40 years, the arc of change. And the iPhone was about a decade, you know, five years from now, AI is going to change things, you know, tremendously. Uh, and the arc is going to be, you know, shorter uh, for that disruption to take place is my take on, mm -hmm. on the robots. Interesting take on that. Um, I, I want to touch upon what you said about just trying to be good at what you do. So one of the questions uh, the audience asks is like how to be good at it. What maybe perhaps what can you share some resources to follow to keep up to date with marketing trends? Or is there any news or newsletters or podcasts that you would recommend so that this person is up to date or even becoming better at what they do? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not necessarily like, here's a marketing podcast that you should listen to. When you're looking at communicating well, you can listen to almost anything that you're interested in. Uh, and, and the key is to read and consume content every day and then write or broadcast every day. And if you do that, and it doesn't mean you have to publish it, you don't have to like, you know, record yourself doing X, Y, Z and, and publish it. It's just, you know, consume some content and then write about it and, and do that every day. And if you do that, you will become a good writer over time, uh, a good communicator over time. Um, you know, writing something down after you listen to somebody else speak about it forces you to con consolidate your thoughts and organize them uh, and do that in a way where it just takes a bit of practice. Uh, there's a framework and you can, you can look these things up. And again, like these aren't secrets, right? How to, how to tell a story well is well-documented. How to communicate well is well-documented. How to organize yourself through a crisis, well-documented. Um, it's just, you know, taking the time to practice and, and marinate in the mechanics of how this works. Uh, some people do it and some people don't. And, and the people that do, you, you notice the quality of their work is much higher. And it's not because they have this magic aptitude uh, and some people do, but that tends to be the minority. Uh, most of the time it's people who just, you know, practice that every day because they're interested in it. Uh, tend to become the best writers and, and broadcasters over time. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily listening to the latest podcast or to the latest newsletter. It's just um, listening to it, consuming it, taking it, and, and maybe perhaps um, producing it and writing it, as you said, and just refining that, that piece. Um, yeah, you can, you can ask yourself three questions. The first one is, what do I think about this? So you listen to anything and it can be about art or history or literature 
or marketing or digital media or chat GPT or, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, or Elon Musk. It doesn't matter what, what your, what your subject is. It matters that you kind of listen to a bit and then you ask yourself, what do I think about this? And then write about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really the key to becoming a better writer. And after you do that, then you can sort of broaden out and look at, okay, what are the best practices for how I organize my thoughts? What is the best practice in, you know, telling a story? Where do I start? What's a hook? And you can look technically at, at all the things that make, um, you know, something interesting and then go from there. But really, um, if you write something you know about and you're interested in, most of the time, it's going to be better than if you're trying to force yourself to, you know, just pump out something that's technically sound, but you're not into it. Mm -hmm. uh, Gabrielle, and your thoughts on, on the resources and the trends and, and I just think, thoughts? Zoom? I think for the resources, um, I'll give a couple of very broad ones is the American Marketing Association has a Toronto chapter website. Uh, they have a lot of mentor sessions. They have special rates for students. There is, of course, us, the Canadian Marketing Association. We have a very robust website. We have special student rates for everything. A lot of our events are now both in-person and virtual. Um, so I think there's some broad sources like that if marketing is where you want to go. I mean, I if you, if you haven't made that decision, probably the uh, CMA Next website is going to help you with getting some focus on where you might want to go within marketing. Jeff's advice was so sound because practice does um, make progress, <laughs> not necessarily perfection, but it certainly does make progress. And um, it, it, Jeff just gave this great example of you can have a, a very wealthy institution, get a thousand people in the room and you've got their attention and then you're rambling off some corporate speak that no one is listening to. So picture for all you students that are on this call, go to some TED Talks, but what you pull out of it is, how, what did I really like about how that person was speaking? What was in that person's communication that really kept my interest? And you know, those are the things that you can work on um, long before you, uh, long before you land that job. I mean, think about how much more interesting you would be in one of those information interviews if you practiced a little bit and you ask some keen questions uh, and, and or just even ask, what's your perspective on that? Do you agree with that? All of those kinds of questions um, and making yourself do that um, after you've listened to a podcast. There's, there's a lot of podcasts on um, the CMA website as well. Um, and of course, that I mean, that's one thing that is readily available, but it's not necessarily just to get the information, the detail in it. It's also to analyze what you think would work for you. Um, we're all very different in our communication style. So these will help you get to know them better. Mm -hmm. One of our, our um, attendees was asking about CMA and how to join. Gabrielle, uh, about is there... Um, is there a cost to it? And can you talk more about the value for our CMA members? So how can CMA membership is organization based. Um, however, there are over 35 schools, uh, colleges and universities in Canada that are members of CMA. So the first thing to do is figure out whether your college is a member of CMA. And if it is, or university, then that means you are a member as well. So that's number one. Number two, the CMA Next platform is free. There's no cost at all, you just sign up for it. And the third one that I mentioned, which is the CMA website, that's also free to access, but membership itself is organization-based. So um, if you're working even as an intern at an organization, um, then ask about that. Say, by the way, are, are you guys members of the CMA? Because that would give them access as well, as a member even. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, we have a question from one of the audience members about uh, internships. She uh, is a student at Humber College, second year business marketing diploma student. I'm on my summer break right now looking for internships. But for that, many people told me to create a portfolio so that, so do you have any tips on how a marketing starts with making a portfolio who's never done any of internships before? Um, so any tips on creating portfolios? 
and perhaps to help with the internships. Uh, Jeff? Um, I'll for sure, yeah. So if, if you're in a spot where you don't have a long tail of experience, again, I would just pick some subjects that you're interested in and work on them. Uh, and so if you don't have, you know, and like I worked at this college or I worked at Sagecom or I interned at CMA or whatever, <laughs> you know, you, you should do things like start a podcast with your friend and talk about something you're interested in and publish those. Uh, you know, write about some things that you're interested in, design something, whatever it is, you can make a portfolio out of anything. The point isn't really about the portfolio for a lot of hiring managers at places that you probably want to work. Uh, the, the point is that we want to understand how you think. And if we can, if you can demonstrate how you think through your work, uh, that's one way that you can stand out when you're looking to get an internship or a job or anything down the road. So if you pick this really acute lane uh, and you start a, something cost effective to do like a podcast or something like that, and you, you know, interview a few people and maybe you get a pseudo celebrity or expert on there as a guest and you have these kind of things, you're just kind of like, oh, you know, right there, you've demonstrated that you have enough aptitude to figure out this ecosystem, uh, how to, uh, you know, go about planning the show and writing the show and executing on the show and uh, all that kind of stuff. And like, oh, you've had some actually pretty interesting guests. And you start to demonstrate like, hey, you can handle a project. Uh, you can handle these kinds of things. And then I see in my own organization, oh, I can definitely put them on these four or five things. And so, you know, again, if, if you don't have a long tail of experience, just choose something you're interested in, angle it, angle it toward, if it's Marcom, uh, you know, that particular area or medium to express your work and just light up what you're interested in. That tends to make the best kind of work anyway. And that's a great way to get started if you don't have a bunch of internships already. Mm -hmm. Great, great tips. Gabrielle, your, your thoughts on internships and creating a portfolio? Um, anything you wanted to add? The portfolio, as, as Jeff says, is a demonstration that you have some creativity, that you're willing to go the extra mile. What I mean by creativity is exactly what Jeff said. You don't necessarily have to have a portfolio of work that you've already done. The employer isn't really expecting that, um, but they do want to see a sample of something um, that you've put some thought into. The other thing that I am aware of, um, just me personally, is that a lot of internships are given out much earlier in the year. So for those who are, want to apply for one, I do believe you have to start in March and April looking for them because they go pretty quickly. What, one other thing that was um, an unintended consequence, I think, of the pandemic is that a lot of people are not in the office. And they do feel that um, an intern doesn't really get the benefit if, if there is not people around. So a lot of enterprise level companies have reduced the number of internships they have available because they're simply not in the office all the time. I, I think that's changing, um, particularly for enterprise level companies. They're going back to the offices at least three days a week. But, you know, that's been hard for students, really hard. It's taken away some of the opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll just add to like the whole intern thing is sort of like, oh, it's a person we're getting in for cheap labor. Right now, there are five full time employees working at Sagecom that were all interns. And one of them probably had the most impact on our corporate culture than the founders did. And so there's room for you to show up at an organization, understand what they're trying to achieve and add value in a way where you're a solid member of the team, not someone just kind of hanging out that's doing, you know, money for money for nothing kind of thing. Um, that, that There's a ton of value there. Some of the most talented people I've ever worked with and are working with now at my organization started as interns. And so we're working with two different schools. Uh, right now, we have an intern program. Uh, we hire two or three of them in different areas, design, digital media, communications every year. 
And that really serves as a pipeline for how we hire. And it's probably, we've probably hired more interns full-time than we have gone externally, found a successful candidate and brought them in. So there's real opportunity out there, especially in the marketing and communications field. Absolutely. What a great way to uh, build a talent pipeline for organizations. Um, just to follow up from that same person, are there any marketing tools that can be helpful for students to work on uh, for projects? Any marketing tools that you can suggest? There, there might be something on the CMA Next platform. Um, I don't want to take my attention away from here and go to a different screen and start searching it, but I would definitely suggest someone search the CMA Next uh, platform to see if there are tips on creating a portfolio or any other discussion around that. Yeah, so marketing tools that can be helpful for students to work on projects. I think it's a good idea to get familiar with industry standard platforms uh, that, that are in the space. So you want to get good at Asana, you know, platforms yeah. like that that are that are rooted in uh, project management uh, you, and communication, uh, Slack. Uh, you want to get good at that. You want to get good at Google Drive. Uh, the Microsoft suite, if you're going that route, but these are sort of table stakes. Any organization that you work with are going to have a version of those industry standard platforms that make up the root of how their, their marketing stack of how they operate. And then if you get into a specific area, uh, you know, like digital media or design, then you want to move into and understand tools like, you know, Hootsuite and, and things like that to manage social or, uh, the Adobe Creative Suite, if you're moving into design, that sort of thing. But again, th these are all communication vehicles. I'm expressing myself through art. If I'm a designer, I'm expressing myself through, um, you know, copy. If I'm I'm communicating, and uh, Asana is about communication. Even though you think it's about project management, it's about communicating well with your teammates. And so is Slack, and so is Google Drive. It's all about integration and communication. And you need to be able to communicate well with your peers just as much as you need to communicate externally to your, your clients and your customers and the communities you care about. Mm -hmm. Perhaps maybe one of the best things is to look at the job description and the tools that the um, targeted role is, is requiring and use that as a guide to perhaps learn that before you uh, apply if you, if you don't have that particular skill yet. Um, we have two more questions from the audience. Uh, first one, um, what are the industries and fields of market that would probably get a boom in the near future, in the long term? So your crystal ball of Jeff and Gabrielle, what you think? And being a student and enthusiast in food industry, I'm interested in knowing the predictions and trends that are going to take place in food and agriculture industry in the future. Is taking a career in food industry safer in Canada? So A, um, who, what industries do you think will be a boom? And two, uh, any predictions in the uh, food and agriculture industry? I'll pass yeah, so you. yeah, I can take a run at that. I have absolutely no idea the answer to any, any of those questions. Um, it's kind of like, you know, trying to pick stocks, it's not really something gonna happen because industries change. However, I think there are industries you can look at in terms of, you know, design and development and climate change. Uh, you know, th these are all areas that, um, you know, and, and uh, like if you're if you're a miner right now and you're able to pull lithium out of the ground and you're good at running, you know, iron ore, like you're you're about to you're about to move into a a, a pretty significant boon. Um, and same for the, the big problems that we're looking to solve. I would look at the world in terms of, is there a problem? Is that connected to something you're interested in? So we have a problem with climate and we need to solve for that. And so there are a bunch of organizations out there doing that and they all need marketing and communication support uh, big time. And the government needs help communicating why we should care about this particular issue. And so you know, I, I would look at it that way. Um, in terms of like tourism and, and you know, agriculture and, and those kinds of things, I think 
that's connected to climate change as well. And so I think making food sustainable and healthy and, you know, all of those things, if I was starting now, I'd look at kind of where the puck is going and, you know, we need to feed a lot of people. We need to make that sustainable. And I think those are good, you know, long-term bets. Um, but again, I would just look at, you know, what, what problem do we need to solve that's intractable right now? And there's, you know, a dozen doozies and, uh, I would, I would, you know, align those to my career choices advice I give to my kids right now, learn how to communicate, learn how to build and design and develop things and just be, just be a nice, good person to work with. And you'll have your pick of, of opportunities. Um, uh, you know, we, we were supposed to have about 75 million people in Canada right now in order for us to, you know, do all of the things we're going to do. Uh, and so there's going to be shortages in healthcare and climate and all these kinds of things. And so, you know, uh, there's not enough people for us to sustain economically what we're up to right now. And that's why we're trying to attract more and more people into the country. And so I think that's a big opportunity. Um, and I know things look tough right now and interest rates are high and we came out of pandemic. Graduating right now is difficult. I can't even imagine how difficult, but in this challenging time, there is, I promise you, a ton of opportunity. Um, it's just a matter of kind of looking at where those problems are and getting it on the ground floor to help solve them. Um, there's opportunity there too. I think Jeff just mentioned something really, really interesting. And that is, he talked about what, what skills, what knowledge you might acquire, but he was saying also to his kids, you know, like be kind to people, work well with people. We've seen such huge differences in uh, what we what we were seeking in, say, a leader. Um, you know, at one time, there were very strong leaders, uh, somewhat dictatorial, made decisions very quickly without necessarily consultation. And then we looked for authentic leaders. Uh, and then we looked for, uh, today we look for those that are more empathetic, that have a high IQ. Um, so what all of that just means is get to know yourself, know your values, know your emotional quotient. Those are very, very uh, big things that come into play, even in an internship. I just love the fact that Jeff mentioned that he's had an intern that has made a huge difference in their corporate culture. I'm working with someone right now who is um, only a year in, into the role um, and is in fact learning a whole new section. And her insights and her questions just blow me away some days. Uh, I feel like I'm learning every day from her. So, you know, it's a, it's a really important um, side of working that we all have to keep working on and uh, something you can do at any time. You can start that at any time in your career. Absolutely. And I think one of the last questions that we have is that hidden job market. Uh, Jeff, you were saying that, you know, these interns became um, uh, workers in your, in your current organizations. The last question is, what about finding opportunities with small businesses that don't advertise? So I guess they're talking about that hidden job market. How can they tap into that hidden job market? Do you have any strategies uh, in order for them to uh, get started? Yeah, for sure. I'll tell you a story about this one. I think I made a video about this somewhere. Maybe I'll, I'll try to find it and put it in the chat if we have time before I go. But this one international student who inspired me like crazy when I was working in higher education and he would just show up, like relentlessly show up. He was everywhere and not in like an invasive or an intrusive way, but he was like, I think I want to work in this department. And he'd just start hanging out there. And later on, he'd be working there. And I'd be like, oh, congratulations. Like, yeah, I got jobs. Cool. And then he wanted to work at the convention center. And he started hanging out there. He started going to all the events and meeting the staff and doing all that stuff. A couple months go by. There he is, you know, working at the convention center. And so those hidden job markets, like just find out what you're interested in. Make a list of organizations that you want to work for. And it's not about like sending your resume in, 
It's about finding a way to introduce yourself to that organization and share with them and the world what you're passionate about and do that over and over and over again, because that is infectious and it's memorable. And I know it can be frustrating when you kind of get a bunch of jobs and you throw out a bunch, like 200 resumes, nobody calls you back. Uh, that's because that's what everybody else is doing. But very few people are making the effort and putting in the time to hang out uh, and hang out well. And the people that do that end up becoming tethered to the organization and staying. Like the interns aren't here because we have some charitable thing that we're doing for interns. They're here because they showed up and they added value immediately. And it was more, it was, it would be painful for us to let them go. Uh, because they became valuable to the organization. You can become valuable to the organization, even though they're not paying you. Uh, you can volunteer there. Uh, you can make relationships. Um, and so, yeah, that that's the way that, you know, they're not advertising for a job. Uh, most of the time when you're going to get a star player, they're not out there looking for a job. You kind of call them and say, this is what's going on. Do you want to have a meeting? Do you want to just hang out? And then you do, and then maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. But um, we've hired a number of people when we were never looking for a position. Uh, somebody just kind of contacted us or somebody else said, you know what? This person kind of feels like you guys. Can you, do you want to hang out? And we did. And that person's actually our, our uh, creative director right now. And it was just an introduction. Didn't know them. We hung out and we we're like, you got to work here. Um, so yeah, make connections with humans and, and leave the HR resume. It's not to say you stop doing that, but don't make that the focal point of your strategy for getting a job or an internship. And, and having a job gap, uh, would, uh, does that matter to you as an employer? No, and we're like a small organization. So maybe not the best litmus test for that question, but like, I don't even know where most of the people worked or went to school that it's mostly about fit and anything that we do in our business i'm confident that anyone could learn even if they were an intern uh you know because you have to continuously learn new things in this in this field we started a project we're working on a health and homelessness and we were hired to do communications for this project. And I couldn't write the first sentence because I didn't understand the language. I didn't understand what was okay to say. I didn't understand what wasn't okay to say. And I literally had to, you know, write and hang out with people in that industry, frontline workers who do that work every day to understand how to communicate to that group. And it took me months before I got good at it. And I've been doing this for 20 years. And so, you have to be humble enough to realize that, you know, you still got to get to know people and trends and, and different things in order to be potent. Um, I, I just want to squeeze into one last question, uh, Gabrielle. Um, where can students find volunteering opportunity? Ah, they can at the Canadian Marketing Association. I put the, uh, I put the website in. There are lots of opportunities. We have a huge annual award, um, dinner and gala, and we always have a number of student volunteers at that, but we have them at our, our, our events as well. Um, so that certainly is one place where they can volunteer. And I'm pretty sure that there are some other suggestions on that CMA Next website as well. Right. Thank you so much. And uh, they, some, some of the students were wondering if they can connect with you on LinkedIn, if that's a possibility. That, that would be the first thing that I think that they should do. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you taking your time today to provide some valuable insights to our international students. Uh, before you go, uh, audience, please, I'm gonna launch a quick uh, um, poll. We're always looking to improve. Please go ahead and submit your evaluation. And um, while we do that, thank you again, Gabrielle, Jeff, uh, for your time. You're very welcome. It was great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care, Have a good night. Take care, Jeff. See you, Gabrielle.
Take care.